Hi, my name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri, and this is a show called Insight. Uh, we discuss books on politics on this show, both domestically and internationally, sometimes books that have a historical perspective that provide some insight into the present, and sometimes books on a broader trend analysis developing that put political developments into a broader setting. Uh, today's book is on domestic politics. It's written by Liliana Mason, and the title of her book is called Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity. Now, joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Jesse Bassler. To uh, Jesse's right is Anna Reynolds. And to Anna's right is Cameron Jones. Now, I wanted to read an opening quote from the book and then we can jump into a discussion about what the author has to say. The author writes, the election of Donald Trump is the culmination of a process by which the American electorate has become deeply socially divided along partisan lines. As the political parties have grown racially, religiously, and socially distant from one another, a new kind of social discourse has been growing. The increasing political divide has allowed political, public, electoral, and national norms to be broken with little or no consequence. The norms of racial, religious, and cultural respect have deteriorated. Partisan battles have helped organize Americans distrust for the other in politically powerful ways. In this political environment, a candidate who picks up the banner of us versus them and winning versus losing is almost guaranteed to tap into a current of resentment and anger across racial, religious, and cultural lines which have recently divided neatly by political party. Exactly. So in our modern America today, when we talk about political parties instead of just how you voted, it's more so a revealing of your, your morals, your beliefs, how you hold yourself in society, and your societal views. And so that's kind of transitioned, as we'll learn in this book, is that it used to be your political party was just a minor fraction of yourself, and now we look at political parties as your, your culmination of your entire humanity, almost. And I think people treat it that way, which is where we get this great division. And I think we're seeing it a lot more today now so than we did in the past. Absolutely. Um, political parties used to be very much issue-oriented, and voters would rely on their political parties to give them at least a peripheral understanding of platform issues. But now that there's that social component, it has very much devolved into an us versus them mentality. Yeah, this all goes back into one of the main features of the book, uh, which is this use of psychological research into group dynamics and conflict between groups as an explanation for this current political climate. Uh, at no other point in history have the two po political parties hated each other as much as they do now. And as the book explains, it all goes back into identity and into this us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the beginning of the book, she talked about something called the robber's cave experiment and showed that kids, uh, how they were organized in different groups, that you can then develop sort of a hostility towards the other side, and there was no attempt to even try and understand and get along, and that immediately you were creating an us versus them environment. And so this sort of experiment, she says, as you can see this in politics, how you then start to have this us versus them, and it's uh, us against the world. But uh, the broader way I think she tries to show it is it now is sort of, or you have your entire almost life system put into this, that it's like you're do or die. And, uh, and so as a result, it's sort of almost difficult to develop some sort of a detached way of looking at something. I thought that was extremely interesting. In the book, like you said, she delves into a lot of the psychological impacts of identity and groupthink. So in the experiment, you see the kids bonding together over their team name and competition sports for a trophy. Mm -hmm. But the big thing that she focuses on is that conflict is the competition, but it's the hatred of the other side increases when there's the idea or perceived idea of limited resources. So we see that today in politics is it's us versus them, my piece of the cake can't be as big as your piece of the cake. And I think that's where we got a lot of fear and resentment is that 
no human wants to say, oh, they're getting more than I am. And so now we look at political parties and the aspects of health care and jobs and security and immigration as if I can't have it, neither can you, or if you have more, I have less. And so it's, it's kind of interesting how you can compare a group of schoolboys playing baseball to now the political climate of adults in America. Yeah, there's absolutely a component of, in politics, there's winning in regards to activism based on the greater good, but there's also a component now with the increase of social issues being added to politics for winning for the sake of winning. And that's, that's actually unfortunately doing the opposite and harming the greater good, which was sort of addressed in the robber cave experiment between the two teams of fifth grade boys. Yeah, and an important thing about the experiment that the author always goes back to is that the boys prior to this were demographically the same, basically. They were a part of the same groups. Uh, something that you see now and something that the author refers to is that when you have people from different groups, it, it takes on a new dimension. Uh, sh the author likes to refer back to what if one group was all Protestant and the other was all Catholic? How much more competitive would they be if they had this unifying uh, trait in common? The uh, idea of winner, winning for the sake of winning and sort of separating the idea of any policy related issue to where you stand related to your political party. Uh, it's interesting because she spends time talking about that. She says, look, we looked at issues and sure we like to say, oh no, no, the Republicans stand here on this issue and the Democrats stand here. Says, no, that's all nonsense because then once you start to take a look at they'll change their tune, they become less concerned with security uh, if there's a Republican in the White House, but more concerned if there's a Democrat in the White House. So suddenly now you sort of change depending on who's in the White House and then your position changes. I was thinking about that. Uh, Trump, for example, is now announcing that the uh, Justice Department is going to try and go ahead and completely overturn the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Well. I'm trying to think, well, the vast majority of Americans support the idea of guarantees uh, addressing pre-existing con pre conditions. And so I'm wondering, you're going to see Democrats protest, but Republicans who are going to be equally as hurt by it, they'll probably keep their mouth shut and won't care. Exactly. Because after all, it's their guy in the White House, so he's allowed to do what he wants to us in a very adverse way that will harm us from a health point of view. But that's okay. He's Republican, I'm Republican. And when you go through this book, you see that in this sort of almost social setting sense. Exactly. It's this in-group thing. So even if you don't agree with what the party is saying, sometimes you'll just be quiet or just even approve of what they're doing because it's your party. It's the group that you've assimilated yourself to. And that can be a lot of danger in politics is that aligning yourself, even if your morals disagree, simply because your party is there and your party is quote unquote winning. So the idea that we have a Republican president, that means that people who are leaning towards more of his actions and his group are going to just silently sit by as he does things, even if they don't agree with it, which happens on both sides. Whatever the party leaders or even the president or people in Congress decide, party people will just go along with that, even if it doesn't really align with their morals or their political beliefs. Yeah, the author talks about how party identity is much stronger than the actual issues within the party. She addressed a survey at which point um, Republicans and Democrats were asked about their views on welfare, except the two parties were told that, for instance, the Republican Party was told that, oh, well, your party believes that there should be more welfare, and the Democrats were told, oh, no, no, they believe there should be less welfare. And both participants were able to come up with legitimate reasons why there should be more welfare or less welfare, because they believed that that was the party line. They believed that that was their sense of identity. And so it just went to prove that really the identity had more to do with anything and what they believed than did the actual issue. Yeah, in a lot of ways, the labels, and the book talk, talks about this quite a bit, the labels liberal and conservative are more just labels. It often has less to do with what a person actually thinks. They're more likely to go along, like you said, with the experiment that was done earlier and just follow the party line because most of the time people aren't going to be you know great policy experts they're not going to know a ton about this they're going to just sort of follow what their you know the leadership or their elected officials are going along are saying the uh, quote she has on that in fact says the vast majority of american citizens are not and cannot be expected to be political experts they do not read legislation Many do not even know which party is currently in the majority. 
but most voters have a sense of party loyalty and so you have this sort of well they're my side I don't know if they know a thing about them but I'm on that side exactly and that's kind of why the founding fathers were sort of against political parties until they happen is because the idea of this group think can kind of be hazardous is that people align with their party like you said to give them an idea of how they should vote because they're not going to read legislation that might just be me that does that but I sit there and you have to go through politics and there's so much to read and learn to align yourself with so simply they choose a politician that they think agrees with them and their morals and they vote how they vote they vote with their party and that can kind of be an issue because not only is majority of America not voting but even and fewer people actually know what they're voting about. You could do a survey saying, how'd you vote? And then ask them why, and they'll say, well, that's how my party voted. They don't actually know the issue. And that can be kind of hazardous to American yeah. politics. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. It, uh, so a lot of times, party will, nowadays, is determined sort of by various factors, such as your family, where you live, race, religion, all that. It goes into uh, what you know, groups you belong to. If you live in an urban area, you're more likely to be Democrat. If you live in a rural area, you're more likely to be Republican. And more often than not, that's what determines a person's party more than any opinions about policy or legislation. Now, uh, one of the things she does is to say that but when you're doing this, then you lose the sense of civic responsibility because you're so worried about our side has to win and your entire almost self-worth seems to be tied up in winning and losing of your party that as a result you really can't be detached enough to see broader issues of saying what James Madison would call the public good. Exactly, this kind of group support. I compare it to the Super Bowl. Everyone has such visceral opinions about a team, but the issue now is when it's in politics and there's voting, these things actually affect our daily lives. They affect the rights of individuals. So when you get pulled over for a ticket for a cop, they have to know the laws. They expect you to know what you're doing and how it's affecting you. So I think we should treat it the same way with politics. If you're going to vote on a law or be participant in voting, you should know what you're voting on. You should know how it's going to affect you. If anything, I view it as a responsibility, if not a duty, because these things that you decide when you vote Vote, when you choose your politicians, when you choose electorates, is because those are affecting your daily life. They're going to affect other people's lives. They affect everything from economy to health care to social issues. And so you need to know what you're voting on. But if you're going to vote, at least be reasonable about how you do it. And to understand that there are, when you're voting on legislation, there are experts that you can go to that are nonpartisan. There are economists, there are scientists. So depending on the piece of legislation you're looking at, there are absolutely ways that you can get your information that are nonpartisan, that aren't party-based, that you can get more objective um, information about your legislation that will help you become a more informed voter because, as you said, it truly is a responsibility. One of the interesting features of that is she uses a term called cross pressures and by that now is that if you're willing to have any sense of awareness in a neutral or okay positive way about the other side you're going to be less likely to vote so that you have to be that social homogeneous everything is isolated into my universe so I can only take a look at this then you're more actively involved which is why you end up producing candidates that are a reflection of that and you're hoping these candidates could somehow step above the fray and sort of think well okay I know the sort of people that elected me a lot of them are hell-bent on willing to go off the cliff and they don't give a damn about a thing but how do I think in terms beyond sort of their simple short-sightedness to some broader issues and you're wondering gee well if you know you let people that reflect this sort of I'm gonna drive the bus off the cliff approach I don't care about nothing uh, and long as my side wins that's all I care about hell with anything and so she's trying to show you you know that it, these sort of ways of looking at it is like a complete rationality that goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We so focus on like, I want this person to win because they view my thing and, it, and you don't really care how what happens or how they vote because the issue is a lot of politicians when we vote them in don't vote how they're expected to vote. They kind of do their own thing as much as we wish they would follow the electorate that got them there. But this idea that you choose your party and you kind of go along with them but you kind of have an irresponsibility because you truly don't care how they vote, how it happens after 
after you get them into office. You just care about getting them there. And that's why she kind of noticed that people who kind of branch outside their party, they look at the other side, end up kind of reducing their voter participation because they don't want to vote completely with their party and they don't want to vote against the other party. But now, unfortunately, the, the issue is that we have polarization because people would rather vote against the other party simply so their party can win rather than actually caring about what happens. What she does know, however, is that people who retain cross-cutting identities, and the example she gives is somebody who is Irish and Jewish rather than Irish and Catholic, because Irish and Catholic would be considered a more privileged identity as opposed to Irish and Jewish. They aren't apathetic. They're just more tolerant. And because of this, they, as, as you said, they just can't completely identify all the way down the line with one party. And it makes it difficult for them to buy into this partisan belief that, well, it has to be all one way or the highway. And th that is a really difficult way to, to be forced to vote. And there's also the aspect of people that are a part of these very homogenous groups that fall into all the different categories, check all the boxes for the various parties' identities, they're the ones that are more likely to you know, view the party as the big part of their identity. So it's going to be sort of a personal deal instead of just sort of a neutral bystander. In-group bias is the term she uses that once you're part of this, that's how you're going to re-look at only information, essentially, that rationalizes what you want, which then leads to her other term, motivated, motivational reasoning. So you're going to go to convoluted logics to support everything that wants to go on. When you read articles on farmers who are being absolutely horrendously shafted by Trump administration trade war policies, but they're not going to stop supporting Donald Trump even though their businesses are going down the toilet. And you look and say, well, how can they at least say, okay, I still want to be a good Republican, but I got to emphasize to let these people know that they're doing something to me. But instead, you go, well, it's sooner or later and it'll be okay, even though you're still going down the toilet. And I was trying reading on farmers like that and thinking, and as I read this book, I was trying to put it into that setting. How do you sort of say, okay, I'm not going to necessarily become a Democrat, but how do I say you better change and become more of a reasonable, rational individual as a Republican and then drive the bus off the cliff? just because you want to drive it off the cliff. Exactly, this in-group bias, even when it starts to hurt yourself, as we've seen with modern political parties on both sides, but especially with the Republican side, is that certain policies that they're initiating are actually hurting members of their party, like we said, the farmers and the low income. But these people will still vote this way and support it simply because it's their party. They kind of remove themselves from logical arguments saying, okay, well, this is hurting me, maybe I shouldn't be supportive of it. And instead they go to this, okay, well, if my party thinks this is the best, it's the best, even when they can see the issues and the damages. And I think that's a big thing that we have today in modern society is we're very exclusive into our own ideas and we'll kind of find a way to argue for our side even when we know our side is wrong. And I understand that that's kind of a human defense mechanism. You don't want to be proving yourself wrong. But if you see an issue in your political party, you should stand up against it and kind of focus on, okay, we need to fix this rather than just going along with it because sooner or later it's going to get a lot worse. Yeah. Her quote I like on this, more often than not, citizens do not choose which party to support based on policy opinion. They alter their policy opinion according to which party they support. Exactly. They just kind of go with whatever the flow is of their party. They see this and they say, okay, well, I don't really agree with that, but it's the Republican notion and I'm a Republican, so let me guide that that way. It's sort of the idea of issue-based social polarization versus social polarization in that, you know, if it's an issue-based polarization, you're able to remove yourself in the emotional capacity and say, okay, well, I, I need to reevaluate these issues specifically and, are, you know, were these issues to m align more with the other party, then so be it. But with the social polarization, you're saying, well, this person looks like me, whether it be in race, in gender, in whatever. And so because they look like me and they're like me, I'm going to align myself with them whether their issues make sense or not. And that's what's becoming dangerous. That's what's creating this level of partisanship. Yeah. It goes into another thing which you see a lot in modern discourse is this whole notion of one party being the good guys and one side being the bad guys where you have winning is more important than what is actually the greater good because 
it's sort of like your earlier example of the Super Bowl. In a lot of ways, that's what politics has become for a lot of people. It's every policy issue is just another Super Bowl. Yeah, she, her concept of polarization, you have policy polarization and social polarization, and social polarization matters more than policy polarization. And so as a result, then, you're going to defend your side, and this is what she goes on to talk about, which means you're not willing to compromise, so that you're just going to escalate conflict. Exactly. I'm kind of guilty of this myself, but when you're faced with the opposing opinion, be it the opposing party or someone else's morals, you get defensive and you start to align yourself even more so because you feel that you're being threatened, that your ideas are being threatened. And the issue with that is that exchange of information, exchange of ideas is what grows people, it's what grows society. And I think that was a lot more prevalent in older times in politics. We were accepting of listening to the other side at least. And now to this point where we're talking to people and you're introducing yourself to people, you find out like they're the opposing politics side, you kind of shut them off. And I think I've been guilty of that multiple times, but I've seen it a lot, is that instead of pushing yourself to see the other side or challenging your own beliefs, you'd rather just sit comfortably where you are and disprove all those others and kind of ignore them as a plausible idea. Something to be noted within the social polarization kind of umbrella is the idea of social identity. And I think that social identity is something that's not going to be removed from politics within the near future. And the reason that's important is because politics have played an important role in giving marginalized groups a voice, whether it's the women's suffrage movement or LGBTQ marriage equality. And political um, po just political action in general has been necessary in providing a voice for those groups. So it's important to distinguish the difference between groups who are marginalized who need this voice and bringing social identity into politics versus completely going off and being polarized and saying, well, now I just won't accept you as a human being with value. Yeah, in a lot of other situations, it, going back into the, solar, the social polarization bit, is that a lot of people are nowadays are choosing to live around people that have the same values and ideas as them, follow the, follow the same political parties, in a lot of ways so they don't have to associate with the other side as much. And that is one of the things that the author says has contributed a lot to the polarization that we're starting to see today, is that you don't see much interaction between the two sides anymore. He, she's tracing sort of where this came from, uh, sort of has three, I think, factors. One is the emergence of civil rights in the mid-1960s, and that this sort of contributes to the racial. And then the second one, she said, is the emergence of uh, the religious right during uh, the late 1980s and into the 1990s. And then the third she attributes to television, that as you create segmented programs like Fox News, for example, then you also have them to help to articulate. Essentially, people who don't know how to articulate from themselves are sort of told how to articulate by people on, say, Fox News. Exactly. So a lot of political analysts today, we still focus on the token idea of, okay, well, minorities will vote certain ways, women vote a certain way, age groups vote a certain way, which is still true statistically. But I think what a lot of people ignore is, like you've been saying, the social identity. Because regardless of like who you associate with, how you're raised, you can still choose. Most people do choose the political party of their parents as they've been assimilated into that area. But I think the interesting thing she kind of brings up is media. And media is so prevalent in forcing our ideas. And a lot of times, that's the way we get our political news. We don't look at C-SPAN and watch congressional roll call and all that. We look at Fox News is telling me this, CNN is telling me this, which one do I sort of agree with? And then we get locked into this notion, and it's even found in algorithms and social media sites, is however you like pictures from a Democrat, or if you like Republican memes, or whatever you're going to follow, it kind of tapers your audience to that, so you are going to continue to see stuff from your party, and rarely will you see stuff that opposes it, unless you go out of your way to befriend people or follow opposing sites. And I think that's something that people kind of ignore today. It doesn't matter who you are, your race, your gender, your age, your sexuality. It's whatever you're viewing is going to determine your politics. Yeah, and what was fascinating when you mentioned the Republican Party sort of becoming the Christian Party or the Family Values Party, at least in how they're portrayed, is that, that just, it didn't just happen. There was a process by which there was a Christian coalition formed that merged with the Republican Party. And that's why still today the Republican Party is known as the Christian Party and many white wealthy Christians will continue to vote Republican and it was I mean there have been similar demographic shifts with the Democratic Party and so 
it's something that voters don't think about, but there have been specific shifts that have happened that cause voters of different demographics to vote certain ways. It goes into sort of this notion of an echo chamber that we often see in media today. It's that you're only hearing things that agree with your opinion and nothing really contrary to that is being introduced. It, it, media has become sort of this slanted policy tool in a way for the various parties. Yeah, her, uh, one of her main points here is that uh, what brings this social sort of cleavage about is the decline in trust in government, which seems to be across lots of segments of people. So as you see a decline in trust in government, it relates to a decline in civic engagement, which she says people not being involved in sort of uh, a number of uh, participatory activities unrelated to politics, that they might participate in PTA organizations or they might join a club. Uh, and so as a result, you ended up creating sort of a vacuum or a void and politics filled that. And so now you're using politics in place of what should have been normal uh, engagement by going to the bowling alley. Exactly. It's something that we get to talk about a lot. And instead of saying, like, how's the weather? How's your job? Now people want to talk about the wild thing Trump did on the news or the political issues. And hmm. I think a lot of people can use politics in a healthy way. But right now as a society, we're not. We're using it as a, like a cleavage. We're, we're disseminating between the groups rather than bonding together. Now, we only have a few minutes left. So what do you think of this book? And do you recommend it to uh, viewers? I think it was an exceptional book. I think it covered a lot of different bases. And my big thing is that she focused more on the social sense of the aspects rather than just rattling off statistics. She still uses facts and knowledge and information-based history, but for the most part, she kind of explains it in a way that everyone can understand. The text was very graph and chart heavy, so just be prepared to unravel some graphics, but the author provided a valuable explanation of partisanship in America, which I appreciated, um, and she has seriously evaluated the issues and encourages readers to do as much, simply than clinging to party identity when you're making informed voting decisions. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the fact that she included psychological studies into group dynamics. The Robbers Cave experiment that was talked about in the beginning is a major theme throughout the book, and I believe that that provides a very good explanation as to so why the parties are acting the way they do, and I'd recommend it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think what the book helps to do is that you see why people can uh, cut off their nose to spite their face, is that you get this feeling of, uh, I'm sitting there and looking at Trump with his uh, trade policies that are absolutely shafting his supporters, and they uh, sort of go, well, it's okay, it's Donald Trump, he's doing it to us, it's not a problem, even though he is destroying our business and our family life. Or how you're looking at the same thing with health care, that he seems to be willing to take away pre-existing condition guarantees uh, to make sure those things don't come back. And his supporters go, yeah, it's completely acceptable. And so this book helps to put some of that thinking, why that is, uh, and that as a result, you can't make the simple assumption, oh, they're all going to now become Democrats. That's the silly part. Uh, so it's a good book. We all recommend it. Thank you for joining us.